progress. Okay, so let's begin with the word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath, for your forgiveness and love towards us. Even though we are frail and faulty human beings, you have sought to lift us up out of the pit of sin, that we may glorify your name upon this earth and to, to all the worlds. We know, Lord, that we are unworthy to understand these things, that we make many mistakes in our understanding. And uh, we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can be here to correct and guide us. As we look at this topic this afternoon on the Sabbath, we ask for your special presence to be with us. We need you every hour and every moment. And we just pray that you can be with each one, that your angels can watch over us, and that your Holy Spirit can speak deep into our hearts and to our minds, and that we can see wonderful things out of thy law. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone. Now, uh, this study here is um, something I've been putting together for quite a long time, and uh, there's much that I still need to learn, and much that I'm uncertain about, but I'm going to address the things that I know to be true from God's Word, and some of the things that we're going to be presenting are things that well, they don't come from God's word. They're just looking at the world around us. And those things we can be less certain about. Um, but we, we can look at them in the light of God's word. So uh, the first document you see here, uh, this is Avro Manhattan from the Vatican and World Politics. And um, Avro Manhattan is... You know, he's not an Adventist. He's not a Christian, as far as I know. I'm not really sure what his belief system was. But he's a person who was looking at uh, the history of this world and, um, and, and trying to make predictions. And he had the God-given insight to recognize the role of the Catholic Church or the Vatican in world politics. And so um, uh, we're going to look at what he says. And I've, I've read these things before, uh, some of the things we're going to look at, and some of the things are new. But he has an interesting observation. Now, this is written in, um, I believe it's 1949 um, that he wrote this. It has the date at the end of this. And this is the preface to the Amer American edition of his book. He says, within the last few decades, amid the rumblings and the ruins of two world wars, the United States of America has emerged paramount and dynamic on the stage of global politics from across the great land mass of Eurasia, Russia, the bastion of communism, equally dynamic in its struggle to build up a new political structure is challengingly waiting for the tumbling of the old pattern of society. Confident, confident that time is on her side. At the same time, the Catholic Church, seemingly preoccupied only with its religious tasks, is feverishly engaged in a race for the ultimate spiritual conquest of the world. But whereas the exertions of the USA and of the USSR are followed with growing apprehension. Those of the Vatican are seldom scrutinized, yet not a single event of importance that has contributed to the present chaotic state of affairs has occurred without the Vatican taking an active part in it. The Catholic population of the world, 400 millions, which of course is a lot more than that now, is more numerous than that of the United States and Soviet Russia put together. Of course, there's much more now in both those countries. When it is remembered that the concerted activities of this gigantic spiritual mass depend on the lips of a single man, the apathy of non-Catholic American 
should swiftly turn to keenest attention. His interest, furthermore, should increase when he is made aware that the United States is intimately involved in the attainment of both the immediate and the ultimate goals of the Vatican. So this is something that Avro Manhattan is aware of, that there is, um, that the United States is connected with, with the Vatican. And, um, and these goals are, so they, they both have uh, uh, the goal, both the Vatican and the United States, both have the goal of the annihilation of communism in Soviet Russia. The Vatican has the goal of the spiritual conquest of the USA and the ultimate Catholicization of the world. Now, back in 1949, this might have seemed a little bit, um, well, I don't know if this would be commonly accepted. Now he says, do these goals seem fantastic? Unfortunately, they are neither speculation nor wild and idle dreams. They are as indisputable and as inextricably a part of contemporary history as the rise of Hitler, the defeat of Japan, the splitting of the atom, the existence of communism. Indeed, the inescapable alternative by which mankind today is confronted is not whether this will be the American or the Russian century, but whether this might not, after all, become the Catholic century. Surely then, the nature, aims, and workings of the Catholic Church deserve some scrutiny. The American citizen, perturbed by the past, bewildered by the present, and made increasingly anxious about the future, would do well to ponder the exertions of the Vatican in contemporary American and world politics. His destiny, as well as the destiny of the United States, and indeed of mankind, has been and will continue to be profoundly affected by the activities of an institution which, although a church, is nonetheless as mighty a political power as the mightiest nation of the planet. So, yeah, so written by Afro Manhattan from London in 1949. Now, I've, I've often put these uh, together. Now, this is um, Louis F. Weir. So Louis F. Weir has a very similar perspective as Avro Manhattan's. Um, and I, I probably should have found the page that I wanted to use. But it was just interesting here, just the context in which he's writing. And I believe this is, is 1957, this paper was published. Um, he says, crowding upon us are the crises of the nations, the unique crisis of the Suez Canal involving Egypt, Britain, France, and the United Nations, the United States, and the Eastern nations, and the world in general. Friction between the Israeli government and surrounding Arab countries, the menacing shadow of the Russian bear, and the upheavals in the Russian-dominated countries of Hungary, Poland, and so forth. So there was a lot going on um, after the Second World War. and um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the Suez crisis uh, that he talks about here, but this is basically, it's a, a war uh, between Egypt and Israel. Um, so there was definitely lots of things going on at this time. And, and when we look at, so when we're looking at politics from a biblical perspective, who's in charge? What is, it, what is it we see in the play and counterplay of, of human events? God is in charge. God is in charge. God sits enthroned, right? These events that appear to be just at the, the caprice or will of individuals and countries that just appear to be the results of random chance are things where God ultimately is overseeing and guiding the affairs of men. And this is something that we always need to keep in mind. That is, people have ambitions, nations have ambitions, governments, the elites, they have ambitions of what they believe they can accomplish. But those things are really out of their hand, ultimately. God is the one that's in charge. So, um, 
and we know that the basic way that we understand what's coming upon the world has to do with um, Daniel chapter 11. And this is one of the things that, uh, um, I should have found the page, but um, that Lewis F. Weir addresses in his writings. He had an understanding of Daniel chapter 11, the chapter 11 verse 40a was uh, fulfilled in 1798 with um, France being the king of the south and the papacy being the king of the north. And he's looking for Daniel 11 verse 40b to be fulfilled by an alliance between the papacy and the United States to conquer the king of the south. Now, let me see if I can find this here. Um, I know what it looks like once I find it. So he's dealing with a lot about what was happening there um, with Hungary and so forth. So there was a lot of current events that he was addressing. Um, Okay, so here it is, uh, part of this. He says, some years ago, when the writer published The King of the North at Jerusalem and Europe and Armageddon, communistic forces were at the crest of their power, and the position taken in those books was simply based upon the exposition of the Word of God. With almost dramatic suddenness, the world events have changed and have begun to justify the interpretation presented. So one of the things that Lewis F. Weir argues about, and we, we, we addressed this when we were studying um, the foundation of this movement, examining the foundation, and we looked at the interpretation that was done by the pioneers when they tried to understand what was happening, what we call the Eastern question. And Uri Smith takes this position and makes some predictions, which of course don't come to pass, based upon what was going to happen in end time events connected with um, Turkey. Now, the argument that Lewis F. Weir makes is that we can't use world events, that is we can't look at what's happening now and, and try to interpret the Bible based on what we think is going to happen and just get the Bible to fit some kind of interpretation. That, we, that is, we need to look at the Bible and what the Bible says. So when he initially looks at his interpretation, it's not something that was readily evident when he first interpreted Daniel 11, verse 40b, as being a union of the United States and the papacy to overthrow communism. So it wasn't something that would just... He wasn't just reading the headlines and then interpreting the Bible to fit those headlines. But now he could see that those things are coming to pass, though they don't unfold as quickly as he believed uh, back in 1957. But he says here, uh, while communism is still a great force and will no doubt yet reveal great strength and occasion further bloodshed in fighting for its existence, yet recent revelations indicate that someday in the not too distant future, the forces of atheistic communism will be temporarily subdued by the combined forces of Christendom. This eventuality, which is even now discernible as emerging from the events precipitated by the Hungarian unrest, has been outlined in Bible prophecy to, as, to occur as one of the greatest changes bringing about the final movements, which will be rapid ones. For when the way is open for the rise of the political power of the papacy, it will not be long before God's people will experience persecution, which will greatly hasten the coming of the close of probation and the commencement of the day of God's wrath. So he's making a prediction which is fairly bold, and, and, and not everything is in here. Um, that's, I can't remember what page it was on. Okay. He's going to quote some spirit of prophecy, which we're very familiar with. Um, the fast fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is near at hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The calamities by land and by sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war are portentous. 
they forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world, and the final movements will be rapid ones. The condition of things in the world shows that troublous times are right upon us. The daily papers are full of indications of the terrible conflict in the near future. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. And that's in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11 and 14. So we can see that what Lewis F. Weir was talking about, what Ellen White is talking about, are those final events. Now, what would be the, what, what's the difficulty we face, which I, I addressed, if we look at something like this? In Ellen White's day, I mean, she says that this is going to happen soon. Uh, how come we're still in this this uh, holding pattern, so to speak? Or is she really writing about our time? She's writing about our time. Okay. Um, and now, how can she do that? Why was why is she writing in the sort of the present tense as if she's talking about her time? Because if we apply that the prophets have written more for our time than their time, she's giving a current application that we should pay attention upon. Yeah. And, and we know because 9-11 becomes that way mark. Um, and this is Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, uh, that we can see that this is connected to that history. We spent a lot of time going over the foundation of this message and finding it was it was laid down solidly um, and in God's providence, in God's leading. doesn't mean that we understood everything, but we also know that great changes have taken place in our world in, in a very short period of time. Um, I mean, almost unthinkable changes, unimaginable um, now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not that old, uh, really, but, you know, I've been around a while. And, I mean, it wasn't, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. We could not have imagined the condition of the world today. Even though we had Bible prophecy and we, we would talk about it, we just could not have imagined it. At least I couldn't. Um. And yet the, the thing that I find interesting is the fact that it's so accepted. And, and that's, I think, the thing that's hard to, to sort of, you know, get your mind around is how, how the change just became accepted so quickly. But we saw it happen with the new movement. We saw them go from apparently conservative Adventists uh, to woke and and the question is how does that happen and and the church is moving in that direction now one of the things um and i can never remember if it's Froome or um um uh, cottrell i think it's one of those it could be someone else but they're they're writing about um uh, in the I think it's in in the 70s or 80s, so I'm, I'm not sure. I wish I had this quote. It's just something I remember reading. But they were talking about how the the view of the Godhead that most Adventists cling to is sort of really, which is a type of tritheism, um, that the only way that the change is going to happen in Adventism is for people to die off and a new, new generation to arise. That is, generally these changes happen, not because people themselves change, at least that's the way that I've always understood it. It's just that um, society changes as time moves on. You have whole people dying off. But what we see saw with 
Parminder's movement is that people themselves changed. And, and we're seeing that even today in, in what's happening around us, how people accepted of their freedoms being removed. And if you go back to, you know, 2001 and, you know, almost 21 years ago, um, with the changes that happened in airport security that, that were accepted, and people thought it would be temporary, uh, we can see that it's, it's just now accepted as commonplace. So when we look at um, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at what's happening today. So we've moved past 1989. So this is something that we accept. And we can see that 9-11 occurred. And, and in this movement, we've looked for the Sunday law to be the next great event. So there's quite a few things that I want to go through, and I don't know the best way to do it. Um, now, I have some books here, so I'm just going to stop the share. <clears throat> so these books were lent to me by a friend. Uh, I read this one today and uh, last night, a little bit last night, mostly just today. So um, this is a book written by Klaus, Klaus Schwab and Terry Malaret or something like that. And this book was published on July 9th, 2020, and uh, was written in, in the month of June. So as the pandemic had begun, uh, they put together this book, um, seeing this uh, pandemic as an opportunity for some of the things that they've already discussed earlier. So in 2016, does anybody remember in 2016 uh, what the World Economic Forum had proposed? So I'm not sure how many people are really familiar with the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab. I what there are several initiatives, but I'm not sure which one you're referring to in 2016. Well, in, so in 2016, um, they had um, looked at the year 2030 as a goal. So um, let me just see if I can find it. Well, the United Nations also had 2030. Okay. That's part of their agenda 21. Yeah. So, yeah. So, the, yeah. So, for some reason, people have taken the year 2030. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know. But um, this is from the World Economic Forum website. And this was uh, published in 2016. November 12, 2016, and um, eight predictions for the world in 2030. So uh, all products will become have become services. There will be a global price on carbon. U.S. dominance is over. We have a handful of global powers. Um, farewell, hospital. Hello, homespital. Uh, which sounds quite awful, but anyway, um, maybe a bad choice of words. Um, we are eating much less meat by 2030. Um, is something about the Syrian refugees um, will have come of age by 2030, making the case for economic integration of those that have been forced to flee conflict. Uh, the values that built the West will have been tested to a breaking point. And, and then it says, by 2030s, we'll be ready to move humans toward the red planet. So they, you know, they're going to go to Mars. So now some of these sort of predictions, uh, they remind me of 
um, you know, when I was a kid and you try to imagine what the future is going to be like, you know, you're going to have flying cars and, and all these types of things. But, you know, man's ability to predict the future is pretty poor. So why should we be concerned about um, the World Economic Forum and their forum and their predictions about 2030? I mean, what are the chances that they're right? Why, why, why is there a concern? Well, I think there's a, a lot of people involved in the economic, in the, in the world economic, economic, WEF, <laughs> that are, are very much um, following the line in a sense that they are, um, seem to be part of the club and yeah. they're making things happen. You know, that they are, whatever the plan is for the World Economic Forum, and they are pretty much seeking to implement what they are seeking to achieve. Yeah. So, so all kinds of players are involved. So, I mean, he founded this in 1971. Um, you know, he had all kinds of, you know, crazy ideas, which we're going to look at a little bit. Um, and and you can see the title of this, From Managerial Revolution to the Great Reset. So uh, just to show you something that I have here that was also lent to me. So this is a book. I don't know if you can see that very well. Uh, the cover is not very good. The Managerial Revolution by James Burnham. And uh, it, and we're going to actually look a little bit at some of the things here. Um, it has a, uh, a the, it starts out with a, an article called Second Thoughts on James, James Burnham by George Orwell, um, which I think you're all familiar with, who wrote the book 1984. Uh, so he's a, a critic of James Burnham. And, and really James Burnham, uh, in his book, Managerial Revolution, believed, um, and he was a Marxist originally. Now he ends up becoming what we call a neoconservative. And so I know we're using lots of these, these terms, not everybody's sure what a neoconservative is. And things like Marxist can be almost like a, a non-word. But basically he's a person who admired the Soviet Union, Trotsky and, and these people, um, because he had the belief that the world was moving towards this managerial revolution instead of socialism. Now, the idea is that you know socialism doesn't work, and and what we needed was managers, that is the elite, the people in charge, guiding and directing our lives. And this is supposed to be a a type of scientific approach. Uh, to the problems that exist in this world. Now, as we all know, that most of the problems that exist in the world are because of managers, right? People in agreement with me on that point? No, they're because of sin. Okay. Yes, they're because of sin. I would agree with that. But when man tries to solve the problem of sin, what does he do? He tries to direct other people. He tries to manage them, thinking that he is a better shepherd than Christ. Right. So man intervenes in, in the work of salvation. And we see that. So we use the word managers here because it's being used by this author. But we can see that God's solution to the sin problem comes from God. God is the one who redeems us. Our pastors, our administrators in the church, they're not the ones we look to for salvation, correct? 
correct. Man can't fix the problems. Yeah, man can't fix the problem because we're sinners. So what man does is he tries to tries to fix the problems, but doesn't he make it worse? Yes. Yeah. In many cases. Yeah. Most of the prob problems we make, we face, are because of man's solutions to the problems we face. Man also tries to go out and collect all the information so he can make a good decision. And as you point out, that good decision many times is lacking. Yeah, you know, and, and just on a personal level. So when, when we make decisions, um, let's say I'm going to buy a car. And I, I can use this example because the way that I buy cars is, uh, one is, when you're buying a car, can you know for certain that that car is going to be a good deal? No. No. You, you can do all the research in the world and buy that car and you can get a lemon. And, and I have a friend, every time he's bought a vehicle, he, he, he would spend months sometimes researching what vehicle he should get. And he always ends up with a lemon. And since I don't know enough about cars to make a good decision, I just leave it in God's providence. And I've always had great success with vehicles, except when somebody gave me a vehicle for free once that didn't turn out very good. But, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of money and, and I just trusted that God would put the car. It doesn't mean I was negligent or anything. It's just there's a limitation to human knowledge. And often we think that we can foresee the future. So when we make decisions, the primary thing about a decision is we don't know the end from the beginning like God does. And so we have to act on principle. And the things that we can't see, we entrust to God. That God will lead us and direct us in the right way. Isn't that how we, we follow God and make decisions? Isn't that how we should follow God and make decisions? Yeah, I mean, and, and when we make plans, one of the things I'm, I've always known about any plan I've ever made, it's never turned out the way I expected, but God's plan was always better, even when it wasn't pleasant. Amen to that. So, so entrusting ourselves to God is something that the world cannot comprehend. And people in the world and people who are acting worldly are people who are trying to control and orchestrate events to benefit themselves. And, they, and, and even worse, sometimes they're orchestrating events to benefit us, that is, uh, these busybodies, these do-gooders who think that they know what's best for other people are some of the, the worst. As C.S. Lewis says, they're worse than robber barons because the robber barons can tire out. Um, but these people do so at, at the, um, I can't remember the word he uses, but basically with the approval of their own conscience. So, so when yeah, we... What's that? Sorry. Um, yeah. The word greater good comes in there. Yes, the greater good. So one of the things we will see is that we have this group of people, politicians, um, business leaders, um, et cetera, who believe that they know what's best for us. And that is they look at humanity as some kind of cattle or sheep, right? They don't see us all as valuable individuals. And there's this, this attack upon individualism that's occurring now, where they sort of characterize individualism as selfishness. Does God value individualism? Amen. Each person is valuable and God doesn't treat us like cattle. 
but the governments of the world, administrations in churches, they treat us all as if we're all the same. And when you have your bureaucracy, like we have in the Adventist church, you know, they will send down their dictates from um, the general conference on policies that should be adopted by all churches. And, and often they have no application to the local church that you're a part of. And, and I've seen this happen many times, even from just the Alberta conference. And we would say, we're not going to follow what you're asking. It doesn't apply to us. And Ellen White is quite clear that it's the worker in the field who needs to be making those decisions in his personal connection with God, not some bureaucracy in Battle Creek dictating what people should do. That people should be allowed the freedom to make choices and decisions as God leads them. Now, that's not talking about moral and immoral in that sense that you know the church has to make sure that its members are moral but often just the day-to-day -day decisions are often overseen by others who really have no connection with what's happening there isn't a one-size-fits-all um, policies that can be made on a worldwide level that are going to benefit everyone some people are going to suffer and you know, this, this whole principle uh, is, is extremely important. So we're, we're going to look at this a little bit. Now, we're not going to be covering a lot here today. That is, um, I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of this article. I'm going to read a couple of things, but we're going to look into it in a bit more detail as we go through these studies over the next number of weeks or months. Um, but I'm going to read, this article is interesting. Now, I don't, now, one of the things we have to be careful, we're reading an article that somebody wrote. This person has opinions or views. Uh, they're not Seventh-day Adventists. They're not writing from a biblical perspective. Um, they're writing from a worldly perspective. And remember, we have different powers that are vying for the control of the world. The United States, the West, we might call it, but really primarily the United States, Catholicism, the Vatican, and the globalists. Now, some of these, their interests overlap. And, and, and we know that there are people within each of these that, that connect these different powers together. But the Pope's goal is much different than the goal of America or the goal of the communists. I mean, that's why the papacy sought to overthrow the Soviet Union. But we know that they all work together. There's going to be a threefold union. So um, let's go here again. Um, okay, so it says here, the Great Reset, I'll make this bigger. The Great Reset Initiative is somewhat vague is a somewhat vague call for the need for global stakeholders to coordinate a simultaneous management of the effects of the COVID-19 on the global economy, which they have eerily named as pandemics, which is kind of like economics and pandemic put together. Um, anyway, this we are told will be the new normal, the new reality that we will have to adjust ourselves to for the foreseeable future. It should be known that in nearly at nearly its inception, the World Economic Forum has aligned itself with the Club of Rome, a think tank with an elite membership founded in 1968 to address the problems of mankind. It was concluded by the Club of Rome in their extremely influential Limits of Growth, published in 1972, that such problems could not be solved on their own terms and that all were interrelated. In 1991, Club of Rome co-founder Sir Alexander King stated in the first global revolution, an assessment of the first 30 years of the Club of Rome, that in searching for a common enemy against whom we can unite, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the bill. 
in their totality and in their interactions, these phenomena do constitute a common threat, which must be confronted by everyone together. But in designing these dangers as the enemy, we fall into the trap which we have already warned readers about, namely mistaking symptoms for causes. As these dangers are caused by human intervention in natural processes, and it is only through changed attitudes and behavior that they can be overcome, the real enemy then is humanity itself. <clears throat> so, of course, we know about this idea that man is a cancer upon this earth. Um, so the idea then is one of population control. Now, I want you to, to do a, a thought experiment here. Now, if you had a test tube and um, you had some medium in there that bacteria could grow upon and you, you put some bacteria in that test tube um, and it continues to double, let's say, every, every 10 days or something like that. At what point would that bacteria burst it, it, or at some point, I guess the question is, at some point, would that bacteria burst the test tube? Would it become too crowded? I don't believe so. Okay, and why not? And the bacteria, I mean, in a test tube, either overflow it or basically begin to feed on one another. Okay, well, it couldn't overflow it. Well, and I'm saying it's a closed test tube, so it's closed, a closed environment. Okay. So, so one thing that you could not have is you could not have overpopulation, per se. That is, in a closed environment, you can't have continuous growth. Things change, right? So when we talk about the world, the population crisis, which... I remember hearing about all the time when in the 1970s, you know, that the world, there's going to be too many people on the planet and, you know, we're all going to die. Uh, the problem there is that we live in a closed environment. You can't have too many people on the planet because the planet can only sustain so many people. So at, at some point, if the planet reached its limit, it wouldn't cause the planet to die. What would happen if you if you started to get too many people? People would starve to death. You wouldn't be able to feed them. Okay, well, so you wouldn't get to that point, right? Why, why would we not get to that point? There would be changes. So basically the, the changes would force that this would not happen. Right. And, and those changes would be gradual. They'd happen over time. That is, often it's presented, there's just going to be too many people and one day we're all going to starve. But people's behavior would change long before that. People, if, if there was not resources, and, and we've seen this happen in, in other situations in the past, um, when it's beneficial to have children, people will. When it's not beneficial to have children, people won't. And it, and it has nothing to do with the technology of birth control. The fact is, people won't have children if it's not in their best advantage to have children. People used to have lots of children because it was in their advantage to have lots of children. And that is, people are not going to live beyond their resources. That is, they have to change their behavior. Now, one of the things that changes, of course, is technology. Technology allows us to produce more uh, than we would have in the past. And things that weren't even considered useful, uh, they become very useful, like 
oil and tar used to be uh, basically ha had no value whatsoever. It was actually damaging to the environment until somebody figured that they could take this oil and they could use it as a fuel. And so all of a sudden, you know, and, and they could get it out of the ground and they could then process it and they could use it to run industry. But prior to having machines that could burn fuel like that, uh, oil, oil and gas had no, no purpose or no function. And so, so the world changes to accommodate things. Now, what ends up happening is mankind tries to solve the problems that they imagine exist. And how do they try to solve them? What, what's the problem with their solutions? We've already touched on it a bit. They don't deal with individuals. They only deal with the whole. Okay. So, so they try to solve the problems by controlling other people. That is, they look at other people's behavior, not their own. Correct? Right. Where if they, if they, that is, they treat other people as if other people are ignorant and not doing things in their own best interest, and that they know what's in the best interest for others. Now, we believe in freedom, when we, we say freedom, that people should make their own choices. Now, why do we believe in freedom? Why do we believe that liberty is God-given? God-given right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Why are these God-given? Because coercion is not a principle of God's kingdom. Okay, so God doesn't act that way. He doesn't control us. He gives us freedom. And yet people think, Christians and non-Christians alike, that we should control what other people do when God himself doesn't even do that. God allows people to make choices, terrible choices. Now, there are, of course, are consequences that should happen with things that are crimes and so forth, you know, crimes against others. God lays down what should happen when sin occurs. But God isn't controlling, and because he has the power to control every single one of our actions, but he allows free will, and he allows consequences, both natural and social consequences, to occur uh, when people transgress God's law. <clears throat> now, when we say that, when he says that the real enemy is humanity itself, He's not talking like a Christian, because who is our real enemy? Satan. Well, Satan is. Satan is, but also, am I not my own worst enemy? Isn't it that self needs to be subdued? Correct, self. Okay. So, um, so I mean, it is humanity, but it's not you. It's not the neighbor. The greatest enemy is myself. And I'm the only one that I can control. So when people look at the problem as humanity, of course, it's not them. It's other people that they're seeking to look at as the enemy. So if you believe that the enemy is other people, and you're the good one, the elite, you're in a pretty dangerous situation. 
So it is no surprise that with such a conclusion, part of the solution prescribed was the need for population control. So we're all very familiar with eugenics and these ideas that uh, have gone on. And, and part of this was actually to control um, the population in, in third world countries, which they saw as a threat. And one of the things they didn't want to see is that these third world countries became um, westernized to the extent that we are because there's a limited number of resources and if these people were then to uh, prosper um, that would be bad for the world as a whole and so there's lots of things that went into population control uh, the banning of ddt um, which caused the death of hundreds of millions of africans um, and all in the name of the environment. And something as uh, harmless as DDT uh, was made to be uh, a dangerous chemical. So, um, so there's lots of things that man has done. Now he's going to mention he here uh, these ideas. Um, but he's going to go to this guy, Burnham, James Burnham, the managerial revolution. Uh, it's the ideologies of Burnham that that triggered Orwell to write 1984. So that book I showed you there. Um, now, it says here, this is Christopher Hitchens. Um, and he says, James Burnham is the real intellectual founder of the neoconservative movement and the original proselytizer in America of the theory of totalitarianism. Now, what is a neoconservative? Anybody have an idea what a neoconservative is? Not really a true conservative. Okay. Yeah, so neoconservatism, those are the people that are interested in, um, you know, making the United States a powerful military force. Basically, uh, those would be the peoples that went into Vietnam. Those would be neoconservatives to some degree. And America really was neoconservative for a long time, whether you were Republican or Democrat. Um, now, we often think of them in contrast with uh, liberals, but there's, of course, classical liberals, and then there's more what we call um, the left or the extreme left. So, so we have all these titles and all these technical terms and, and they're used and misused by all different types of people. So, um, so sometimes they're just, they're tags, they don't really mean a lot. But the thing about uh, James Burnham, who was a totalitarianism, he also was, it became a neoconservative. And him and William F. Buckley are the ones that founded uh, the National Review. Now, are people familiar with William F. Buckley? Greatly. Yeah. And and we would look at the National Review as, as a conservative periodical. Um, I used to read the Nat National Review years ago. Um, is, would we consider William F. Buckley, who was a Christian, uh, would we consider him to be a totalitarian and is he a totalitarian mindset being a neoconservative no no so we wouldn't think of him that way but there is there isn't a a really well defined line especially when somebody rejects the gospel that is we think generally speaking conservative good you know, Republican, good, Democrat, bad. You know, we're, we tend to be conservatives. We're Seventh-day Adventists. But we are not to be political. Now, some for some people, that just means you don't vote. Um, but when we get caught up in politics, and I'm not necessarily saying about, you know, the elections and things like that, it can distort our perspective on 
on what's happening around us. That is, we can have sympathies with people that we shouldn't have sympathies with. And, and when we have the split between uh, Parminder's movement, the, the Omega, and the Alpha movement, that split primarily was a, uh, an, a riddle, uh, politically ideological split. Would people agree with me on that? Repeat the question, please. So the people who followed Parminder were liberal. People who rejected Parminder were conservatives. That is, it was a split, not so much over doctrine, even though doctrine was a part of it. But many people rejected Parminder merely because he was a liberal. And they, they were conservative. They may not have understood what he was teaching doctrinally. They might even accepted some of his doctrines along the way. But when it came to making a choice, it was more political than spiritual. People uh, that, I, that I would very greatly agree with, because when he was introducing so many political ideas, mm -hmm. I came to the point that if this was the way that the movement was going to go, I wanted nothing of it. Right. And, and we also saw that on um, October 3rd, 2018, uh, at the prayer meeting at the School of the Prophets, that um, Jeff was very concerned, and, and in some of the meetings around that time, very concerned with the idea that we should get information from CNN. And the reason he was concerned is that he knew that the movement was made up of many people who were conservative, who watched Fox, and that this wasn't going to be very popular with the movement. And, and he took the position that we shouldn't really be watching Fox or CNN, that both are dangerous streams. And, 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 it, and, and it's a difficult topic because, you know, we, I think most of us here would be conservative, you know, in our, in our values. And we would, we definitely disagree with, with uh, CNN and, and our sympathies, our natural sympathies would lie with a lot of the values and ideas that you would see from the conservative side of the political spectrum. But we can't be political. So when Ellen White's talking about politics, she's talking about not just being involved in politics, but even being controlled emotionally or intellectually with these sides that exist. Because both of these sides, even though they appear to be different, aren't they really all the same? Aren't they just the kingdoms of this world? They're the two sides of the same coin. Yes. <clears throat> now, uh, I'm just going to read a little bit here about James Bur Burnham. It says, uh, it is understandably the source of some confusion as to how a former high-level Trotskyite or Trotskyist became the founder of the neoconservative movement with the Trotskyists calling him a traitor to his kind and the neoconservatives describing him as an almost in it as an almost road to Damascus conversion in ideology. However, the truth of the matter is that it is neither. That is James Burnham never changed his beliefs and convictions at any point during his journey through Trotskyism, uh, the OSS CIA intelligence to neoconservatism. Although he may have backstabbed many along the way, and this two-part series will go through why this is the case. So we're not going to go into this two-part series in detail. But the point that I want to bring out is that the sides that we sometimes see, the truckers, you know, the protesting truckers, which we might have sympathy with because they're opposing something that we're opposed to, um, are no more reliable than the people that they're opposing. 
That is, it leads, even though those people may have good intentions, and they may be people that we would get along with, what we see is, is a struggle for power. And we may say, well, this is, this is people fighting for individual rights. They need to be supported by us. But is it the gospel? Not in the least. Not in the least, right? To support protests, even for things that we think are good, are something that Christ never did and never would have supported. He says, if my kingdom was of this world, then would my servants fight. So the gospel cannot be political. And the Adventist church for a long time was able to keep politics out of the church. It hasn't been able to, at least over the last 20 years, but especially in the last uh, couple of years. The church is consumed by politics. <clears throat> Now, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read any more of this today, but I am going to um, address a few points. So, because I'm gonna go through some of this, what this great reset is, um, and and how this fits into Bible prophecy. So, one of the things we can see is we have these three powers for, vying for the control of the world, and and the great reset. Um, is the Pope connected to the Great Reset, for instance? Intimately. Okay. Now, of course, when he looks at it, we know that the Catholic Church has always been socialist. It's always been uh, socialist in their economic principles. That is, they believe uh, that ec economics should be fair and just to all people, that uh, the only people that can get rich, of course, are their friends. But if the average person tries to have too much, he's just greedy and selfish. So capitalism has always been frowned upon by the Catholic Church. And uh, we see this in the United States as well. So that, that capitalism is seen as the enemy. It's, it's, it's unfair, right? That it's just people who are, are seeking to um, gain profit in our, in our culture, in our society, in our media, in our entertainment. Capitalism is presently frowned upon. But that wasn't always the case. America used to celebrate its great capitalists because these people like Henry Ford produced goods and services that benefited everyone. And nobody um, was concerned that they also became wealthy because they weren't just benefiting themselves, they were benefiting others. And when it comes to the globalists, are they opposed to capitalism as well? That is, is capitalism seen as the enemy? Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're going to look at that. I'm going to get some of these statements that address the issue of capitalism. Now, in the, the book, the COVID-19, the, uh, the, COVID the Great Reset, they actually try to argue that capitalism is a modern idea, that it's, it never existed until the 14th century AD, which, of course, is a ridiculous idea that it, it's new. But part of this has to do with the redefining of words and not understanding what capitalism is. Now, um, there is a thing called crony capitalism. Does anybody know what that is? In other words, that only you and your friends should be able to profit from what's going on. Right. So this is the capitalism of that's supported by government. So regulations, um, uh, you know, people having to, let's say if you wanted to sell flowers in certain states in the U.S., you actually have to get a license to sell flowers. And 
And who do you think was most interested in having florists licensed? Growers. Yeah, the florists themselves, right? Because this is a way of securing more profit for themselves. So, so not anybody can just go and sell flowers. Now, it seems like a crazy thing to, to regulate, to have licensing for, but we see that this happens more and more all the time, that in order for somebody to do something, there's all kinds of red tape that they have to go through. They can't just sell stuff. When I used to sell my, my um, cassettes and then my CDs door to door, going door to door with my guitar, if, if I actually looked at the, the rules that existed, by law, I would have to buy a license, a peddler's license, would, which, which would cost me like an extremely exorbitant amount of money, which I could never afford. I, I would never make that much money in a day selling my cassettes. Um, but yet that was what was legally required. Of course, I never did follow that. I just went door to door and sold my cassettes. Um, but uh, when we have regulation, um, it's meant to, uh, to reduce competition. And, and, and we see this, and it also increases the costs of things. So we all think regulation is good. We all like the fact that dog, doctors have to be licensed and dentists have to be licensed and that there's all kinds of regulations because um, those are meant to protect us, right? We would generally agree with that. But is there really a need for all this regulation? And, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, make a case that we should try to get rid of regulation. But I'm just saying that there is control. Um, that means that real capitalism doesn't exist in our society. Our society is partly capitalistic, but partly also government controlled economy. People can't just buy and sell anything they want. You know, and if you're going to sell like a health product, um, it goes through all kinds of regulations. So, um, so I, I want to jump from that. So we're going to look into economics a bit more in some of these things to try to understand what's happening. But the basic idea that we have here is we have these different powers and economics are used to control people. That is, is and where would we get this principle from the Bible? That in the end, economics are going to be involved. Revelation 17. Yeah, or, or Revelation 13. Right. Man, verse 17, that no man might buy or sell save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So we know that our economic welfare is going to be controlled by the state, but it's also going to be a church-state relationship. That is, the conscience is going to be compelled by these powers to act in a certain way. Now, um, so I'm going to look at something else here and dealing with 2030. So we know that 2030 is this date that is talked about. Now in this movement, do we, do we talk about the date 2030? Is, is our concern that in 2030, um, this is going to happen? No. Yeah, so, so, so we're looking at events to happen much sooner than that. But um, when, when I was doing my Week of Christ presentation, so this is where I'm going to sort of start here and end. Um, I don't know how far I can get here on this. But uh, when we looked at the Week of Christ, we saw that there was this structure that was created. And, and this structure that was created is analogous to uh, the prophetic mirror. So we know that um, that prophetic mirror idea is being used by Colin in his presentation on the presidents of the United States. 
and it exists here. And I, I don't want to do a complete study on the prophetic mirror, but just we know that if we take the cross of Christ and we count 1260 days either way, um, that it's not going to line up with the period, the literal period of the 70th week. That is, it's going to be on this side four years short and on this side 46 years short. And then because of that, I had taken this 46 years or this 40, 46 days, pardon me. So it's 46 days short here. This is the 10th day of the seventh month, September 30th, 27 AD. This would be the baptism of Christ if it's exactly uh, at the beginning of the 70th week. And then the end of the 70th week would be October 12, 34 AD. But the 2520 days doesn't cover that period. So this 46 years I saw as being analogous with the 46, 46 days, being analogous with the 46 years from 1798 to 1844. And if that was the case, the 10th day of the seventh month lined up with 1844. So do people understand what I just did here? I took the actual biblical calendar, I worked it out from 27 AD to 34 AD, and I put the cross of Christ here, and I marked the 10th day of the seventh month as the beginning of the 70th week, and the stoning of Stephen as the end of the 70th week, as also being the 10th day of the seventh month, since he sees Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Um, so he sees Michael standing up, right? So he sees the close of probation. And I counted out the literal days, and I found that there was 46 days short on this side. And, and so I said, well, this must be 1798 and 1844. But this is go these dates are going backwards. So I know some of you are familiar with this, watching this. Some of you might not be. But I thought, well, if this is 1844, and this is 1798, then the cross is 538 AD. That is, we're taking the 2520 for Northern Israel, the Satanic Covenant Week, as lining up with the Week of Christ, because it's a counterfeit of that. And then I thought, well, if this is 538 AD, we know that in Daniel chapter 9, where it talks about the midst of the week, it also talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and the question was, what other event would I look for on this line that should line up with a date on the top that would be uh, connected to, the, to that event? And the only event I could think of was the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Now, this, this question was actually asked to me in a Bible study. So I actually did this during a Bible study. I said, well, it's going to be 468 years from 538 to 70 AD. And then I counted backwards um, from tw April 27th, 31 AD or forward, I guess, depends which way you're looking at it, 468 days, and I came up to the 10th day of the fifth month in 32 AD. Now, of course, this isn't 70 AD. This is going to be 38 years prior to 70 AD, but the 10th day of the fifth month there lines up with 70 AD, and that's the date the temple was destroyed. So this showed me that I could take this line of the week of Christ and place years on the bottom going from right to left while the days go from left to right. And so this is a kind of a day for a year prophecy. That is each day going forward represents a year going backwards. Now, while we're at the School of the Prophets, in um, 2018, I was presenting 
uh, these studies on the week of Christ. I presented them at the camp meeting in Alberta in August, and and then we went to to Arkansas in 2018, and I was doing these in a, a regular class classroom setting, uh, presenting the week of Christ. And I also ended up presenting it um, uh, in uh, the camp meeting there in the fall of 2018. Now, but when I was presenting this and I was I was going through this, and I was really going through lots of other things as well, but when we got to this part of it, uh, but one of the things that we could see is if this is the prophetic mirror, we should be able to continue on. So I'm just going to zoom in here a bit so people can see this better. And, and we can see that if I went 19 more years, that would bring us to 1863, of course, but the date there would be uh, September 11th, 27 AD. And so it was interesting, the symbol of September 11th showed up at the end of this prophetic mirror, that is 1863 lines up with the symbol of September 11th in the date above. And then I looked at this 151 years, or which goes from 1863 to 2014. Now this was um, in September, uh, Parminder had just started pr doing presentations, and it was in one of the morning studies. So when I was lying in bed at night, I was doing the calculation in my head based on Stephen's study. So Stephen had done this study where he had taken from uh, the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit's poured out, counting the number of days to October 22nd, 1844. And he took those years as prophetic years minus the Days of Atonement. So he, he divided them by um, 359, and he came up with uh, 1844 and a decimal. Is that correct, Stephen? Yes. Okay. Now, the decimal ended up being 318 days. Which, which became significant, which I'm not going to go into. Um, but he also then, from October 22nd, 1844, took all those Days of Atonement, which is, of course, going to be 100 and 1,844 of them, and counted from October 22nd, 1844, to come to November 9th, 1849. Correct, Stephen? Yes. And this is one of the first indications he had about the date November 9th. Yeah, maybe not the first, but because we also have November 9th, 1989, but as, as a date that could be predicted into the future. Now, Stephen had written an email, sent it to Jeff, and Jeff had presented this at the camp meeting in Alberta, but he didn't present the November 9th part of it. I don't think he quite understood uh, the significance of it at the time. So, uh, just trying to give you a bit of background here. So what ended up happening is, as I, I looked ahead here, I could see this, um, that I could take this 151 years and the 126 years from 1863, uh, so the 100, or from, uh, from 18, 1888, which I don't have in here. So from 1863, the 151 days, now, there's 170 days there, so that's something else, but uh, which it's not important here at this point. But um, this would go to 2014. So this was Parminder's prediction regarding the Sunday Law in 2014. And in 2018, we started looking at this again, maybe even actually earlier, that there was some significance in 2014. We had started this actually in 2017, um, looking at Parminder's time setting again. Now, so at this meeting, I'd done a calculation in my head, and what I did is I took 1844 times 360. So I didn't take those Days of Atonement out, and I counted the number of days from October 22nd, 1844 backwards. So if we did them uh, the way that Stephen does, it, it, it works out differently. It comes to, it's connected to 
the time that Christ spends in the holy place. But by just taking 1844 times 360, I get 663,840 days. And when I counted out the days, it brought me to April 13th, 27 AD, the 17th day of the first month. And at first I thought it might end up on the 16th day of the first month, but it ended up on the 17th day. But the significance here was this was 2014. And, 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 and technically, in a sense, too, it does end up on the 16th day of the first month, ending it, but that's a whole other story. But for now, uh, 2014 was then marked, and I showed this to Parminder, and he thought it was pretty interesting. Um, but from that, I could see that I could continue counting. So if I counted three days later, I would get the 14th day of the first month, which is, of course, Passover, lining up with 2017. Now, down here I have just these years going on. So here I have 2014 and 2017, and you can see that I'm, I'm progressively moving um, to these different dates backwards as I'm moving these years forwards. And so I made a prediction regarding uh, the 12th day of the first month, when, which is when Judas betrays Christ, the 2019 would be the, be the betrayal. And I didn't know how that was going to happen. I had a date here. So the date in the, this is wrong. These dates are wrong here. Um, I'm not sure why I have May 2nd, because that's not the right date. But anyway, some of my dates are wrong here. Uh, but April 8th in 27 AD, it was the 12th day of the first month. April 7th in 27 AD was the 11th day of the first month, etc. And that I could continue counting these, and I would come to the first day of the first month in 27 AD was March 28th. And that would line up with 2030. But of course, what would be the problem with that? I even put here, the second coming. Uh, that was just, I wasn't serious about it, but I put there the second coming just as a, an experiment. So these were my original notes. What would be the problem of taking 2030, the first day of the first month, and lining it up with the second coming? And why would I stop at the first day of the first month? Because then you're time setting. Okay, then I would be time setting. So in my understanding of time setting, we cannot predict the second coming, the close of probation, the outpouring of the latter rain, any of these types of events. Ellen White's very clear, and I was really clear back in 2018, that when we were time setting, we weren't time setting in opposition to Ellen White's counsel, because the counsel was playing. I didn't accept the argument that we could set aside her counsel because of dispensationalism. And, and Parminder didn't originally use that word, but that's what he was implying, and eventually he did use that word. Um, to me, her counsel still stands, and that when we were setting dates, we were measuring time, uh, but we weren't time setting against her counsel. It is, we don't believe that we can predict the second coming of Christ. Now, in the week of Christ, we have, of course, the prophetic week, and we also have the literal week. And that week is going to go from the triumphal entry uh, to the resurrection, correct? Right. Right. So that's going to go from Sunday to Sunday. So that's, that's going to be the week of Christ in, in the literal days. So one of the things that I argued is that we couldn't really predict anything beyond um, the tenth day uh, or the ninth day of the first month when the triumphal entry occurred. So when I put this, this was just kind of me thinking to myself, you know, I understand the importance of the first day of the first month as a symbol. We see that in the story of Ezra. It begins on the first day of the first month in 457 BC, and it ends on the first day of the first month in 456 BC, after they have finished all of the divorces, 
right? So it goes from the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month, which I think is extremely significant that Ezra 7 to 10 does that. Um, so to me, it's an important symbol. But when I looked at this 2030, one is it's, I can't predict the second coming, so I wouldn't have done that. And in, in a sense, the triumphal entry symbolizes the second coming. Um, but I, I put it on the back burner because to me, there was something about this first day of the first month. It's also too far in the future. I mean, we're, make, we're making predictions then about 2019 and then uh, 2020. And, you know, seeking that, seeing that everything should be wrapping up in short order. Um, you know, if Nashville's hit by uh, a nuclear attack um, and that the final events would be rapid ones. So something like 2030 in the future is uh, not something I could predict. Now, I'm not predicting something in the future here, even in looking at 2030 now, but we can see it as a symbol. At least we could see it as a symbol, correct? Agreed. So, so we know that the world is talking about it. So I'm not saying that, you know, we have to look for now a time setting event in, in 2030 and, and we can just forget about everything now. Uh, but we will see as we go through these studies, the significance of 2030 as a symbol and its connection to our time. So when I put a date in the future, that date may only symbolically be connected with our line and it gives us information about our line but it doesn't mean that we can predict an event or even that that date will ever come about that christ could come back before 2030 because i don't believe in time setting right i don't believe that we can predict events especially events like the second coming and and even the sunday law itself my one of my cautions when we put December 25th, 2021, as the Sunday law, I saw it only as a symbol, not as the actual Sunday law. I thought, because I, I would say, well, that's the end of our line, and it would have to happen after that. So what I was doing was putting it more as a limit. Uh, be, the Sunday law can't, couldn't come before December 25th, 2021. So when we marked it as the Sunday law, we were not arguing that the Sunday law is going to happen on, you know, Saturday, December 25th, 2021. But just that the earliest it could occur would be the next day. That, that, and that was, that was the argument that I put forth uh, regarding the Sunday law. Now, I've introduced that date. We're going to look at it in more detail. Uh, in our next study of, of why I, I came to understand this as significant, that there's something about that date 2030 that is connected to our lines and, and specifically the date April 5th, 2030, because that's going to be the first day of the first month in 2030. So we wouldn't look at March 28th. That's the first day of the first month in 27 AD. But just as a symbol, does it mean that something happens on April 5th, 2030? But as a symbol, we're looking at the first day of the first month in 2030, and we will start to recognize that there's a reason why this information was given to us. So, so that's what we're going to be studying, as well as um, the information of how I understand what the goals of the globalists are so we know we have the globalists and we know we have the papacy and we know we have the false prophet and if we're going to understand what's going to happen in the future and our response to it at least how we should act and what kind of message we need to give we need to understand from a biblical pr perspective from the bible and the spirit of prophecy of how we are to to relate to the events that are unfolding before us and not be misguided by personal sentiments. 
So a any thoughts that people have about what they've heard here today? I know this is very sketchy at this point, but we're going to make it all clear as we go through these studies. A any comments? I think you've already given the best comment. There's going to be a lot of need for this to be fleshed out. It's yes, it is very sketchy, but there's a ring of truth with what you're seeing. Okay. Yeah, and 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 the caution. I mean, there's a number of cautions. So one is we're looking at 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 current events, and and it's always a danger because we can get caught up in those, right? Agreed. And and yet we we know that God is leading us and He's giving us information so that we can be prepared for the things that are going to come upon the earth. And if we're going to if we're going to be prepared as a movement, one of the things that we've been doing is we've been examining the foundation, we've been doing methodical work in our personal study and in our group study to understand the purpose of this movement for one but also what is it the what is the message that we are to give and how are we going to give it how are we going to be prepared to give it and we know that this movement made some mistakes especially in regard to parminder in believing that the organization that was going to come about was you know basically from the top down which is not not the right top because organization comes from a connection with christ not a connection with man the connection with man comes only because of our connection with christ so to sort of orchestrate the movement to set up you know its own biblical research institute uh you know its own imprimatur uh upon any article that was going to be written was definitely not something that was directed by God, which we eventually came to realize. So I, I hope this, you know, gives people something to think about. Um, now, as far as what I'm going to present this next, if we're, we're following the example that we did with Stephen studies, this would be in two weeks from now. So, because this was the time slot that Stephen had on Sabbaths. Uh, and, and before, um, so even before we close with prayer, um, does anybody have any ideas about when we should do this next presentation? Because I still have Fridays, I still have a little bit to finish with the presidents of the United States. Is it okay to wait for another two weeks to have a study on this? If people are going to be fine with that. Or could we set some other time to have a study? Part of Stephen's study was very historical. Yeah. And at least for me, when it came to history, you could take the time in between to consider what has gone through the history and to go through back, back through his papers. Okay. What you're laying out here right now is a bit more of a study that needs more repetition okay. for people to be able to understand it. Okay. Do you have any suggestions when we could? I'm put in an I'm, extra think, I'm, I'm thinking about that right now. Okay. So I'll try to get back with you within the next 24 hours. Yeah. Cause, cause, cause some options are, um, like right now we have Friday mornings, we don't have a study, but I mean, that's, that's a possibility to put in a study Friday morning, at least, at least, uh, temporarily until some of these other studies get done. Um, we haven't had a study on Sunday afternoon for a while. Um, so that, that's always a possibility. Um, we also could just take up a, another study on Sabbath at a different time so as not to conflict uh, conflict with um, 
Daniel Fontenot's study. So, so there are some different options, but uh, right. anyway, I want people to consider that. So, what they think about it. I am preparing notes for this. So part of the problem is I, I have to copy and paste a lot of things. Um, and I have stuff in books, which I don't have in PDF format. Um, so it's always nice when you have a PDF, you can just copy and paste it. It's in a book, you got to write it out, you got to type it out. And I'm a terrible typer. Ty I'm terrible at typing. I make way more mistakes uh, typing. You're a terrible typist? Are you serious? Yeah, I'm terrible at it. <laughs> Okay, my Heidi can type, so she says she can help me. So I can just read her the quotes and she can type them in if I can't get them on PDFs. Okay, so let's close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for uh, our Sabbath, the time of fellowship, and uh, all the things that we have been studying we know, Lord, that you have your timing in bringing these things together. And we ask for your wisdom in the timing of these presentations, that your name can be glorified, that we can uh, study these things um, thoroughly and correctly. And we pray that you can bless each person who's, who's searching into these things, that you can lead us from the track of error and have our feet firmly planted upon the path of truth, and that the light of the midnight cry will guide our feet. Be with us now, be with each person, may your angels watch over them, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.